Exactly one year ago, I reviewed one of the best Ultrabooks of 2020, the XPS 13. Uh, the refresh design from Dell brought some amazing features to the table, like a beautiful and bright 16 by 10 display, a keyboard that strikes the right balance for typists, and a premium build quality uh, that you get for such a compact form factor. The performance is also pretty good, but the CPU ran a little bit too hot, and I'm sure you'll find some Reddit forum where you know people talk about quality control issues. But uh, this year, Dell has refreshed the XPS 13 lineup with Intel's newest Tiger Lake processors. And they've also added an OLED display option, which I have over here. Now, I've been using the new XPS 13 for the past few weeks, and I have some thoughts both good and bad, and we'll also find out if Dell addressed any of the issues that were brought up on the 9300 from last year. Also, with the competition getting really good, um, is the new XPS 13 still a good option? Let's find out, but first, let's pay some bills. The Be Quiet Shadow Rock 3. It won't block your memory thanks to the offset construction. It will not sound like a hurricane thanks to the Quiet Shadow Wings 2 fan. It will give you a peace of mind with exceptional cooling, easy installation, and the interesting bicolor design. Check it out below. Okay, so before I get into pricing and spec configurations, I do want to point out something that I discovered on Dell's official website. Um, they're actually offering 11th gen processors on their older design models with the 16 by 9 displays and the battery indicator on the side, which I still miss on the new design IDs. Um, there's only one option with the Core i5 1165G7, 8 gigabytes of RAM, and a 256 gigabyte SSD for less than $900, which is a pretty good deal in my opinion. Now, the new 9310 model starts at $1,000, and for that, you get a Core i3 1115G4 processor with two cores and four threads, 8 gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigabytes of storage, and a Full HD Plus non-touch 500 nit display. For $200 more, you can bump it up to an i5 1135G7 with four additional threads and half a terabyte of storage. Our sample comes fully kitted out with the Core i7-1185G7, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD, and uh, the new 3.5K OLED display. The price, 1900 US dollars. But here's the thing. Dell always has their laptops on sale. In fact, at the time of making this video, I found this particular model for around $1,600. Sometimes you might even be able to find it for less. So just take my advice and never pay full price for Dell or Lenovo laptops when you're shopping on their official website. Just think of it like Canadian Tire. I think most Canadians will get that reference. Anyways, let's start off with exterior impressions. And well, not a lot has changed from the 9300. You still get this beautiful CNC milled aluminum unibody construction throughout the whole chassis. The hinge still feels the same. It's very rigid and smooth with no signs of wobble, even when you use the display as a touch interface. If you recall watching my previous XPS 13 review, I mentioned how the lid wouldn't stay flush to the body, which bothered me quite a bit, but that issue has been addressed on the newer model. It's magnetic and you can open the lid with one hand, uh, so that's nice. It weighs around 2.8 pounds, which is slightly heavier than the ZenBook 13 OLED that I checked out recently, but it's still very thin coming in at 0.58 inches or 14.8 millimeters. I had no issues fitting this thing in my messenger bag that I used to carry with me every day between home and my office. So, you know, it's small and very compact. I love this form factor. The interior space has also remained unchanged. Dell uses the same edge-to-edge -edge keyboard layout. I love how big the keys are and the spacing is adequate. I never found myself making any typos. The keys are excellent. It uses the maglev system found on the XPS 15 and 17. You get great feedback uh, and a very satisfying feel when you bottom out. Seriously, this is one of the best keyboards that you can find for an Ultrabook. The trackpad is still awesome. You still get that super smooth surface with the tactile integrated left and right buttons. Uh, also, I didn't experience any unregistered clicks as I did with the XPS 15 and 17, but that makes sense because the trackpad on this is significantly smaller compared to those laptops. The carbon fiber palm rest is ridiculously comfortable to type on. I honestly just love writing out scripts and stuff like that because, like I said, it just feels so smooth and it does a really good job resisting uh, finger oil, but also it's very easier to clean as well. The built-in fingerprint reader on the power button works 80% of the time. You see, sometimes Windows just refuses to use that type of authentication, so I just have to force myself to use the password to get in. But if you use Windows Hello uh, with the infrared sensors, it works really well. You just, you're automatically in once you open the lid. So yeah, there's that. So this is the webcam test on the XPS 13. Uh, the quality is 
pretty much the same compared to last year's XPS. I mean, Dell hasn't done any significant changes compared to that model. Uh, it's, like I said, it's passable, but at this point, you know, I think it's time for notebook manufacturers to just step up and you know, improve the quality of these sensors because everybody is trying to use them these days, you know, working from home is the norm. So yeah, maybe they should just step it up. The speakers sound really good. In fact, they're positioned in such a way where the sound just sort of bounces to the side off the surface and it gives you really great bass response with good clarity in the high ends. Um, it's really an awesome machine for content consumption and just doing a lot of media related stuff. All right, let's talk display. Dell added a new 3.5K OLED option to the XPS 13, which does a few things differently compared to the standard 1200p non-touch option. The first thing is that it's much sharper given the higher pixel density, and it scales really well within Windows. It also offers deeper blacks, just like AMOLED panels on smartphones, along with vibrant colors. For my analysis, it covers 100% sRGB, 96% Adobe RGB, and 100% DCI-P3. And when you compare that to the standard display, it's an incredible upgrade uh, to edit photos and other types of content that require precise color accuracy. The only thing is that you'll sacrifice on brightness because the 1200p and 4K options go as far as 500 nits, whereas this OLED model uh, only got as far as 387 nits of peak uh, level brightness from my test. Um, it is above average, and Dell has applied an anti-reflective coating to cut down as much as reflection as possible, so it works pretty well for outdoor use. Now, there's always a question of burn-in for OLED displays, and I was curious about it as well, so I reached out to Dell, and this is what they told us. Our display partners are developing more efficient OLED materials that go into the panels themselves. Additionally, they are implementing burn and compensation algorithms that are built right into the panel's technology. As for software solutions, the operating system and graphics partners are implementing tweaks where they avoid long static icon exposure by shifting pixels periodically. This is actually done in a way that isn't noticeable by the end user. So it does look like they've taken care of that concern, which is kind of nice. I should also mention that when I loaded up Premiere Pro, the graphics driver crashed, resulting in this. Yeah, it's not a pleasant experience when you're trying to get any work done. I don't know if I have to blame Adobe for this one. In fact, I most likely would because every time when I open Premiere Pro on any laptop, it just crashes, something goes wrong. So. Yeah, if you do plan on doing a little bit of that or using Adobe programs, just you know, keep that in mind. The port situation is the same. You only get two Thunderbolt 4 USB-C ports, a micro SD card reader, and an audio jack. Now, this is something that you'll have to compromise on when you decide to go super slim. Uh, now, I've been using a Thunderbolt 4 dock from Razer to connect all my accessories and my display, but keep in mind, that Thunderbolt docks in general are really expensive, and it could be an additional investment uh, if you plan on investing or plugging in uh, multiple peripherals if you know that's something that fits your workflow. So um, yeah, it's a compromise. That's all I gotta say. Now, if you're looking to upgrade the XPS 13 later down the road, uh, you're only limited to accessing the primary NVMe SSD. Uh, the memory is unfortunately soldered onto the PCB. Uh, the drive speeds are actually pretty fast. In fact, it's a noticeable improvement over last year's XPS 13, particularly with the right performance. Now, just like every other Windows laptop, Dell has included a few power plants for the end user to play around with, depending on the type of workflow they're used to. So if you fire up Dell's power manager and head into thermal management, um, there are four modes. So optimize basically balances performance, noise, and temperatures. Cool focuses on lowering surface temperatures while increasing fan noise. Quiet is the exact opposite, so higher surface temps and lower fan noise. And finally, there's ultra performance that just pushes fan noise and performance. Speaking of that, I really need to talk about Dell's intent with this generation of XPS 13 laptops. You see, they aren't meant to deliver barn burning performance, but rather a good everyday computing experience. You can see that perfectly in how the CPU draws power. Optimized and ultra performance are pretty much identical where they start out at 27 watts, rise slightly above 30 watts, and then finally level out to just 13 watts. That's just above the i7 11850G7's minimum spec of 12 watts. Both of those modes will only boost performance for shorter workloads, which makes sense since those are the ones you'll most likely encounter on something like the XPS 13. Meanwhile, the quiet mode just heads straight to that 13 watt happy place and cool, 
Well, that focuses on reducing surface temperatures as much as possible, so 10 watts is all it sucks down. All of this translates to clock speeds, but there's something else going on here that's pretty odd. Like clockwork, about every 200 seconds, clock speeds take a huge hit for a little while, and then they go back to normal. It's almost like the CPU needs a little break, takes a breath, and then starts running at full speed again. Let's check out temperatures to see if that's what's causing it. On the positive side, the XPS 13 doesn't get anywhere near throttling temperatures, but as time goes on, it looks like the culprit behind those frequency dips is still a mystery. Also, while Dell's running this at just 13 watts, in the long run, the CPU is actually running faster than the 13 watt i7 1165G7 in the ZenBook Flip S I reviewed just a little while back. But that ZenBook did hit higher speeds in shorter tests, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the performance charts. As for surface temperatures, if you use this laptop in the ultra performance setting for intensive tasks, it gets warmer to the touch, but nothing crazy that would burn your lap. Uh, if you choose the quiet setting, expect it to get a little warmer. Fan noise is very respectable on this laptop, uh, the quiet setting is practically quiet, and the optimized and ultra performance setting perform about the same. The fans do ramp up, but it doesn't get too loud where you're forced to use headphones. Another thing that needs mentioning is battery life, and while Dell supposedly made it one of their key selling points, the OLED screen and relatively small battery work against that claim. I'll be totally honest with you guys, against the competition, just over 10 hours in our tests isn't gonna cut it. This might have been considered okay two years ago, but not against newer Ultrabooks. I'm just sorry, Dell, this is just a swing and a miss. Now, this is a bit better result, but not all that much. You also need to remember that the XPS 13 is operating at just 13 watts, making it one of the most efficient CPUs here, so Dell had their cards stacked in their favor, but still couldn't get to the 3R mark. Now, as we go through these real-world benchmarks, one thing is pretty evident. While AMD's Zen 3 is a huge winner in almost every benchmark, their supply trouble means if you actually want to buy a laptop right now, you'll need to jump onto the Intel wagon or look for a 4000U series device. In that respect, the XPS 13 OLED is a pretty solid middle of the pack performer and its scores start improving as we get into lightly threaded benchmarks. Seeing its position improve basic apps is actually something we've always seen from Tiger Lake CPUs. Um, their single thread performance is really, really good, and that shows here. As for Premiere, well, the 13 watt allocated to the XPS 13 CPU ends up hurting, and the only thing keeping it from a dead last finish is the fact Intel's XE graphics had a really good encode and decode engine. The interesting thing about these gaming results are they aren't half bad for a thin and light gaming laptop with an integrated GPU and a processor operating at such a low wattage. I mean, you aren't gonna be winning any online tournaments, but the results are good enough for some casual gaming and popular games. The only exception to that is Rainbow Six, which for whatever crazy reason, Intel is still having problems uh, with a year afterwards. I just don't get it. I mean, fix it already. So, is the XPS 13 a good option for users who are looking for a thin and light everyday computing device? Absolutely. Is it perfect? No. You see, there are things that I wish Dell improved compared to the 9300, the first being performance. It's just really unfortunate to see the thermal design limiting the full potential of these new Tiger Lake chips. You know, if they just gave it a little bit more power, maybe redesigned the thermal system, uh, it could have performed really, really well. The battery life is, it's okay. I mean, it's not as good as uh, AMD's Ryzen-based solutions. But at the end of the day, if I take a step back and admire the rest of the hardware, Things like this beautiful unibody construction, a fantastic keyboard and trackpad, a display that just puts a smile on my face. All those factors just make me want to continue using this thing every day. Obviously, I know what some of you guys might be thinking. Apple's M1 MacBook Pros or Microsoft Surface laptops are great alternatives as well, which I don't deny. In fact, I hope to get my hands on those devices at some point. But for now, I think it's time to ditch my Razorbook 13 for this laptop because it's compact, it fits my messenger bag pretty well, it fits my workflow. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. Let us know what you guys think about the XPS 13. And uh, yeah, if you're shopping around for an Ultrabook, would you consider this on the top of your list or is it a meh? I'm curious to know. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Also, spend responsibly, my friends.